Hey there, we've talked about inequalities, right? We realized x doesn't always have to be equal to three. X could be greater than or equal to three. We don't need that perfect equality. This refers to numbers that are three and numbers that are greater than three. That's pretty cool. We could also write something like y is less than negative four, which refers to all numbers that are less than negative four. This includes numbers like three, four, pi, which is about 3.14, any number that's at least three. This includes numbers like negative 4.1, negative seven, negative a million, any number that's less than negative four. These are nice, but they're a little bit basic. You know, with x being at least three, that starts at three and then includes all the greater numbers up to positive infinity. This starts at negative four, but doesn't include negative four, and includes all numbers that are less than that, all the way down to negative infinity. What if we want a stopping point? Or what if we want to split our inequality in two? Well, there are ways that we can do that, and that's with compound inequalities, which is what we're going to talk about today. First, we'll talk about what are called and inequalities. Maybe you can guess what that is. So let's write it over here. We could say that x is at least three, and I'm going to test you here, and let's say x is greater than two. Would that make sense to write? I mean, we could write it, there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it's kind of pointless because any number that is at least three is also greater than two. So if we just wrote that x is greater than or equal to three, that would be referring to the same numbers as this statement. Any number that's at least three is greater than two. So by saying and x is greater than two, we haven't really included any additional information. Now, another thing maybe we could do, here's another test, we could write x is at least three and x is less than one. Would that make sense to write? And no, there kind of is something inherently wrong with this, which is that there are no solutions. There's no number that's at least three and is less than one. You can still write it, but there are no solutions to this compound inequality. The way we use and is, like I said earlier, kind of like a stopping point. So we'll say x is at least three, then we stop, and x is less than 10, for example, which gives us that stopping point. So we could say x is at least three, and x is less than 10. In order to satisfy a compound and inequality, a number has to satisfy both conditions. Solutions to this inequality are greater than or equal to three and less than 10. Now, how would you graph something like this? Well, in a previous lesson, we talked a bit about graphing basic inequalities on a number line, and graphing compound inequalities is not much different. I'll leave a link in the description to that lesson where we graphed basic inequalities. Here's how you do it with a compound and inequality. We're gonna make sure that we can see three and 10 on the number line. So I'm gonna put zero here and go up by units of two. There's two, four, six, eight, 10 and 12. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And I can fit one number here in the negative direction. There's negative two. So how do we graph this and inequality on the number line? Well, we want to include three, right? Three satisfies the inequality because three is at least three and three is less than 10. So at three, which is right in between two and four, we're going to just put a solid colored in point. That includes three. Now you could write this or draw this on the number line, but I think it'll be easier for you to see at least here on my whiteboard by drawing it above the number line. Now we want to include numbers that are greater than three as well. So we'll start drawing this line in the positive direction, but we're gonna have to stop at 10 because we only want to be including numbers that are less than 10. But do we want to include 10? Well, no, because 10 isn't less than 10. So at 10, we put an open circle. 
and then we can finish drawing this line up to 10. That open circle tells us, hey, we're stopping here at 10 and we're not including 10. The solid circle over here at three tells us we're stopping at three and we're including three. So this is how you graph the solutions to this compound inequality, which we would also say is just the graph of this inequality. This is a visual representation of all numbers that are at least three, but are also less than 10. So you can see how this and inequality gives us a stopping point. X is at least three, and x is less than 10, so you gotta stop there instead of veering off to positive infinity. And I hope you can see how this makes it pretty easy to see what sorts of numbers satisfy this inequality and what numbers don't. Does negative two satisfy the inequality? No, negative two is less than 10, but it's not greater than or equal to three, so it doesn't satisfy the inequality. A number like 12, is greater than or equal to three, but it's not less than 10, so it doesn't satisfy the inequality. A number like six is at least three, and it's less than 10. A number has to satisfy both parts of an and inequality in order to be a solution, a number that makes the inequality true. All right, now the other type of compound inequality is pretty cool. It sort of splits our inequality into two parts. It's called an or inequality. So for this other type of compound inequality, we could say y is less than negative four or y is less than negative two, for example. Well, this is sort of a test. Would that make sense to write? Well, you could write it, but again, it wouldn't make that much sense to write because any number that's less than negative four is also less than negative two. So this inequality, y being less than negative two, just contains all solutions to this one plus some extras. So this would be the same as just saying that y is less than negative two because any number that satisfies this inequality will also satisfy this compound inequality in an or inequality, in order to make it true, a number just has to make either one of the pieces true, or it could make both true, but a situation like that is kind of pointless, like we see here. So here's another potential issue. What if we said y is less than negative eight? Well, this is very similar to what we just saw. If a number is less than negative eight, it's certainly less than negative four, so this inequality covers everything that this does. There was no need to make this a compound inequality. We could have just said that y is less than negative four. Any number that satisfies this will satisfy at least one of these two things, and so it will satisfy the compound or inequality. Here's another thing that, that we could have go on. We could say y is less than negative four, or y is greater than negative eight. Now, would something like that make sense? Well, let me give you a quick visual representation. Imagine we got kind of a number line here, right? Say right here is negative four, so negative eight is somewhere down here. The numbers less than negative four are all of these numbers. The numbers that are greater than negative eight are all of these numbers. Oh wait, so that's just every number. Every number satisfies this inequality. So that's a kind of useless thing too. So those are just some sorts of things you can keep your eyes out for. What would make sense is saying something like y is less than negative four or y is greater than three. These two inequalities include different sets of numbers. So it makes sense to include them in a compound inequality. Would it make sense to include these in an and inequality? You could, but it wouldn't really make sense because no number is less than negative four and greater than three. But we can make it an or inequality. The solutions to this or inequality are the numbers that satisfy either one of the pieces. So if a number is less than negative four, it satisfies this inequality. If a number is greater than three, it satisfies this inequality. And let me actually, we used three over here, so let me change this just for kicks to a, a five, and we'll change the greater 
than to a greater than or equal to, just to keep things kind of mixed up. So a number that would satisfy this inequality would be negative seven. That's less than negative four. Five satisfies this because it's at least five. Three does not satisfy this inequality because three is not less than negative four and it's also not greater than or equal to five. So three doesn't satisfy either piece. In order to make the inequality true, a number just has to satisfy one of the pieces. In order to not make it true, a number has to not satisfy either piece. And I think it will certainly help once we graph this on a number line. So here we go, we've got our number line. We're going to have to make sure we can see negative four and C5 on the number line. So we'll put zero there and use kind of small units. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and there's five. And then in the negative direction, there's negative one, there's negative two, there's negative three, and there's negative four. It's a little uneven, but I'm doing my best. I can kind of fit negative five in there as well. All right, so how do we graph the solutions to this compound or inequality? Well, we wanna look at the boundary points as usual. Can y equal negative four? Nah, it's gotta be less than negative four. So at negative four, we'll put an open circle. Then we want to include all the numbers that are less than negative four. So we just draw an arrow in the negative direction. We're including all of those numbers that are less than negative four. Any number that's less than negative four satisfies this and thus it satisfies the compound inequality. It doesn't matter if a number is less than five, as long as it's less than negative four, it works. Now what about five? Can y equal five? Yes, y just has to be greater than or equal to five. So at five, we put a solid circle. And then we want to draw an arrow in the positive direction to also include those numbers that are greater than five. So that's all numbers greater than or equal to five. You can see for an or inequality, all we're really doing is graphing inequalities like normal, we've just got two different inequalities to graph. So this is how you graph and inequalities. A number has to satisfy both pieces to make an and inequality true. You can see how an and inequality gives us a sort of stopping point. Instead of the line going all the way to positive infinity, it stops there at 10. For an or inequality, a number just has to satisfy either one of the pieces, or it could satisfy both, but you're usually not gonna see or inequalities like that because they're not really necessary. And you can see how an or inequality kind of splits our inequality, right? We're able to get numbers over here and numbers over there, but we're able to also have this big hole in the middle. Now, if you ever go on to study some formal logic, you'll see that and and or are very strongly related. And let me just give you a quick example to illustrate that. Here's the question. Could we write an inequality to represent all of the numbers that are not solutions to this inequality? Yeah, it wouldn't be that difficult to either. In order to satisfy this inequality, a number has to do this and do this. So if a number doesn't do this or it doesn't do this, it won't satisfy the inequality. So the numbers that aren't a solution to this are the numbers that are less than three, meaning they don't satisfy this, or are greater than or equal to 10, meaning they don't satisfy that. Now, what do you think the, uh, the numbers that aren't solutions to this are? How would we describe the numbers that don't satisfy this or inequality? Well, it's pretty easy. In order to not satisfy the or inequality, a number needs to not satisfy either of the pieces. Because if it satisfies either piece, it makes it true. So it's got to not satisfy either piece, which means it needs to be at least negative four, so it doesn't satisfy that, and it needs to be less than five, so it doesn't satisfy that, and or 
or, and, pretty cool. Again, what we did here at the end was just write inequalities representing the numbers that aren't solutions to the blue inequalities. If you didn't quite follow me there at the end, no worries, but I thought that was kind of cool. Sorry guys, one last thing I forgot to mention. I should have mentioned this earlier. This is how we're gonna write or inequalities. There's really no other better way to do it. But for and inequalities, well, we see here X is kind of between three and 10, so we can combine these into just one string of inequalities. The way we would normally write this is that X is greater than or equal to three and less than 10. Doesn't that look a whole lot nicer than that? I would say, yes, it does. So that's how we write and inequalities. You stick the less than part over here, stick the greater than or equal part over there, and you are good to go. One last thing I'll mention, if both of the inequalities are strict inequalities, here we could say X is between three and 10. If they were both uh, allowing equality, then we would say that X is between three and 10 inclusive. X is between three and 10 inclusive, meaning we're including three and 10. If it's mixed, so we have a strict inequality and uh, greater than or equal to like we do there, there's not really a super great way of saying that. So remember to write your and inequalities like that. It's a lot nicer, a lot easier. And let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Next time, we'll talk a bit about solving these types of inequalities. So when we have something, I don't know, like two is less than or equal to four X plus three is less than or equal to 27. How are you gonna solve something like that? We'll talk about it. Woman with a known face chokes night and says, oh, what a lovely day. It's tight 